This is John Reed. I am live from the Upper Edge offices. I'm joined by John Belden and Adam Mansfield. How's it going, guys? You can wave. Terrific. <laughs> yep. They're, they're kind of off mic right now, but you'll be able to hear them better once we actually start talking. So why am I here? Why did I drag my hungover self after this tough Bruins loss last night, Game 7? Anyway, that's hockey talk. You guys probably don't want to hear a hockey breakdown on this podcast. Why am I here? I'm here because uh, Upper Edge, an advisory firm for the information technology space, has really upped their game in a lot of different ways. One thing I really like about Upper Edge, which we'll talk a little bit about, is they're independent. In other words, they don't take any vendor money. can't say that about many firms in this entire enterprise software space. Even those that might claim to be independent, they still take vendor money. Uh, Diginomica takes vendor money. It's pretty obvious. We disclose that, but there you go. So, so Upper Edge is pretty unique in that regard, and about... Two years ago, I noticed UpRedge was really dramatically upping their blogging game. So uh, what used to feel a little more like kind of advertorial, kind of project brochure stuff turned into a really interesting blog. And two of my favorite UpRedge bloggers are joining me. I've got John Belden. He writes a lot about digital transformations. So we're going to talk about that. I've got Adam Mansfield. He writes a lot about cloud. In fact, he has a regular column now called Head in the Cloud. So we're going to talk about cloud issues as well. Um, so these guys are going to chime in and hopefully by the end of it, we'll get to some topical items around things like uh, Tableau being acquired and by Salesforce because that's right in Adam's beat as well as Google Cloud outages and other things that are also right in your wheelhouse. So anyhow, this should be a full slate of topics. Uh, so John, I want to really start with you and digital transformation because um, I'm fresh off PTC Liveworks. I spent two days talking about IoT and augmented reality, but at the core of it was really this concept of digital transformation. And while I'm something of an advocate of transformation and why I think companies need to take the concept seriously, let's face it, it's also one of the best vendor sales techniques ever created. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you get on the path of digital transformation, um, you're going to be buying a lot of new software <laughs> and you're going to be procuring a lot of new services. And so I think there's also a pushback around that to try to figure out a couple of really big things. For example, how real is this for customers? And also, how do they go about it without getting into trouble? Because a lot of your blog posts seem to be about companies getting into trouble around this topic. Yeah. yeah well, it's, it, I, I like your point about uh, the vendors pushing it. It's almost like... Um Y2K 2.0, right? It's the new thing out there, digital transformation, and all of a sudden everybody has to do it just like Y2K, right? So that's the the pull on that. Um, on on digital transformation, and you're right, I write, I write a lot about failures. So if I'm thinking about digital transformation and I'm thinking about failures, I would tell my clients there's two big mistakes that clients can make when they start down a digital transformation. One is thinking that it's exactly the same as an ERP-based transformation, right? Because there's a lot of things different. You alluded to some of it. There's, I'll call it um, representation of brand, I think is more at stake when you're doing a digital transformation to the extent that it's facing uh, their customers. Security is another issue associated with digital transformation that's completely different than ERP because now you have to worry about, I'll call it the outside coming in. So the biggest mistake they can make is assuming that it's just like ERP. The second biggest mistake they can make is assuming it's not like ERP because all of the same things that you had to do with an ERP implementation, all the things that are important with an ERP transformation are also important from a digital transformation point of view. And I've seen so many clients make either one of those two mistakes and not address both sets of concerns. Mm. And you had a recent post, CEOs and CFOs held accountable for digital transformation failures. Revlon joins the crowded ranks. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, that was, that. so what inspired that? Uh, well, I mean, Revlon itself, there was one lawsuit that was out there that was filed against uh, Revlon by the shareholders themselves. Uh, and what we've, what we've seen on that one is it's actually been five to seven lawsuits that have now been filed against Revlon. Uh, Revlon by their shareholders, uh, primarily because Revlon <clears throat> wasn't straightforward and honest with regards to their, and actually for them, it was an ERP implementation. It was, again, it, they called it digital transformation, but it was an ERP implementation. And it goes directly to Revlon not having good controls 
over the actual implementation itself and not being able to all say track the effectiveness of the implementation. And the shareholders are now going back to Revlon and saying, you said everything was under control. You said this was fully audited. It clearly wasn't fully audited. We want our money back for the shareholder loss. And that's how they're holding them accountable. And mm-hmm. actually, Revlon's kind of an interesting one because I think they're suing three CEOs and three CFOs because they've changed over the last two years. Uh, so they've got a whole wide spew of everybody they're suing. Yeah, time to update your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> I'm currently being sued by Revlon. Yep. Uh, yeah, so uh, so so maybe both you guys have a, have a thought on this one, but – Digital transformation, to what extent do you feel this is a real thing? In other words, do you think for customers this is a real imperative? Are they are they at risk of falling behind and, and, and not being competitive if they don't take this issue seriously? Uh, and again, I te- I'm going to give you the consultant answer. It depends, mm-hmm. right? It depends on the industry you're in, yeah. uh, you know, primarily on the industry. If you were to say a manufacturing company, by and large, that's where I come from, manufacturing company, um, hardcore manufacturing. Perhaps not as important as a consumer retail company where you have to stay current with the retail. You have to stay current with the consumers. Um, So I would put it in that. The answer is depends. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting because there's a couple ways to look at it in terms of like end goal success. And I think what we're seeing is it's more about what is the uh, driver behind that, right? And so how do you define success in the first place? And the thing you constantly hear about, especially the cloud vendors that I particularly spend a lot of my time on, Salesforce, ServiceNow, Microsoft, so forth and so on, it is, okay, digital transformation, let's talk about it from a customer success perspective, right? And so if you have an organization like a service cloud or a sales cloud that's trying to drive efficiencies through their platform, their solutions, and you get buy-in from a CEO who's now tied to that vision, success may come into many different forms. It may be because of the fact that we're turning around response times at a much faster rate. It could come in the fact that if our sales organization is able to meet a need while in the field, I can close a deal sooner. There's a revenue side to it. I think the problem is, is that a lot of these organizations, these enterprises are getting hung up in digital transformation as an end state. I would ask them to look at it more of a state that's going to be ongoing and then let the vendors tell you their place at that particular point in time. Mm. And then a very specific example is one that we're seeing a lot of, which is a transformation of the approach is this digital transformation in regarding giving your employees the functionality that they need to be productive, not from a business necessarily perspective, but to employee satisfaction. And so where I'm really going with this is there's a lot of enterprises that we work with, retailers, large shop floor manufacturers that understand, and this is being driven by HR, that we haven't given our employees access to tools that they're telling us they want. And so there's a mandate coming from the top, not necessarily to drive revenue or productivity, but to literally drive or check a box in some instances, HR initiatives of Sally on the shop floor doesn't have the tools she needs. Let's give her Mm. a particular collaboration tool. Let's give her F1 because Microsoft's in here telling us, and oh yeah, Google, why don't we give them G Suite, their enterprise ready? And so there's this whole process. And so thinking about digital transformation, thinking about success, it's not just in one or two pillars, it's now evolving. And these vendors are very good at finding the way with those business executive level people to sell the technology, to tell the Mm -hmm. IT departments, go get that. Yeah, I like what you're saying. You're preaching to my choir about employee empowerment, I guess you could say, Mm -hmm. because I just really wonder how all this customer experience hype can ever become real when you have disempowered, frustrated, underpaid employees, which is a classic problem, especially in retail scenarios. And so without that, and, 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 and the other point you're making, which I think is really important is, I think I like the concept of digital transformation a lot more when when a customer owns it for themselves and then vendors are put on notice to, to fit into certain aspects of that as, as the customer sees fit. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's a customer driven initiative rather than I'm signed on to such and such systems integrator to handle digital transformation for me. Right. You know, which you still see. And that's a, and just to jump on that. It's, it's a really, really important point, right? 
there's a lot of organizations that we work with that could be on the smaller side or the larger side, different industries. There's a commonality though, which is these organizations have gotten to a place where they have a strategic vendor. So let's talk, whether it's Deloitte, Accenture, whoever it may be, they're guiding. And now what's happening is they have their other strategic vendor, which could be a sales force who wants the big piece of the pie. And so you're starting to see, and this is prevalent, a sales force and an Accenture or a Deloitte teaming mm. to set the vision because the CEO or the business lead is looking at them going, well, those are our two trusted partners. Of course, they're unified on the vision. Why wouldn't we follow that? And mm -hmm. then what's happening is they're almost not taking a back seat, which by the way, probably leads to a lot of these lawsuits at the end of the day because they think they have air cover, right? Because it's been mm -hmm. driven by our consultants. The problem is, is that too many organizations aren't first stepping in and saying, here is the vision. Right. It may not be correct. This is what we believe it to be. Now yeah. you go figure out how we get there and come back with us with actual actionable suggestions to make changes where it's needed mm. versus you go first. Usually when you let them go first, momentum, business case, we have to catch up. We have to do those things. Our competitors are doing. It's very easy to just take it and continue down the path without questioning. Yeah, one of the, one of the uh, points you brought up hey, I've got a systems integrator and they're handling a digital transformation. Perfect case study on that one, Hertz. If you looked at what Hertz did, uh, and now they've got their lawsuit out there with Accenture right now, but they literally turned over 80% of their transformation to Accenture and said, we want you to do this. And in, in the words of Agile, they made Accenture the product owner for what they were trying to go to market rather than Hertz being the product owner. And Hertz was under tremendous amount of pressure. Uber was just killing those guys on renting cars, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're getting into another app out there that says, oh, by the way, you can, you can loan your car out to uh, like a, I'll call it like a lease. So Hertz is in real, real, real trouble right now. And they just kind of turned everything over to Accenture and put it in the tank. And in that scenario, under being held more accountable, when they kicked Accenture out, the CEO literally came down and started running that project mm -hmm. on behalf of the project team until they hired in another CIO six months later or so. But she was really accountable. Right. So there's a, there's a customer accountability issue around owning digital transformation. Uh, and then I would argue, which we'll get into a little bit later, the importance of not over relying on a handful of primes. We're, you know, you mentioned some names, we're not necessarily picking on those folks right. because no, it's no. really, you know, I mean, this goes on for eras, right? We could, you know, 10 years ago, it could have been IBM and such and such, same concept, same problem. Uh, yeah. I would tell you through our research, John, project failures themselves are vendor agnostic from a software standpoint, SI agnostic, you know, manufacturing agnostic doesn't really matter, right? Yeah. I mean, all, all I can find you a lawsuit out there for every single SI, every single one. So, yeah. All right, so so let's just for the sake of argument, let's let's assume that there were a customer that where where digital transformation is important in in our particular industry or situation. Yep. There's still a lot of perils around this. Why, why you've written a lot about this. Why is this so hard? Like, like, like e even assuming that we did all the basic things that we all understand around, like get yeah. top executive buy-in and all that good stuff. It's still hard. Yeah. So why? Um, if you start with, and I'll, I'm going to just give you kind of the, the lay of the land from my perspective of what causes project failures more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's true on digital transformation or any big IT project. Um, if you start with kind of these three pillars of, I got schedule, I got, well, let's, let's call it cost and schedule. I got operational continuity, making sure that when I put this system in, I don't kill the business and I've got the ability to, to capture benefits. Every project starts off with its measures that it's bringing to the, to the C-level executive. And they talk about budget and schedule because it's the only two things that they can measure. Right. Mm. And then they get caught in the trap of those are the important elements of the project. And as they get closer and closer and closer to the actual implementation and budget and schedule are, have been out there as the metric, their behaviors are driven by budget and schedule beyond benefit acquisition and operational continuity. And they start to take risks with the mm. project in order to hit budget and schedule. And that ultimately is what causes the failure. And that's been true since the beginning of time. Yep. 
And then, I, and then I'll just jump in on this. The other part to this that becomes really important in working with organizations um, all the time, and we have this conversation, right? We get in there sometimes, specifically with cloud renewal deals. Um, again, it doesn't matter the vendor. It could be Microsoft. It could be Salesforce, ServiceNow, Workday. It doesn't matter. We get in very early stage and they'll say, hey, listen, I got this renewal coming up. We're a part of, we're doing this digital transformation. We've already made investments in Salesforce. We've done all these great things. We're like, oh, great. So we start peeling it back. And then we meet and we really start looking at it. And we start asking them, okay, you're using Sales Cloud Unlimited Edition. What does that mean? Well, we're using it, but here are the features we're actually using. And you go down the list and it's like 25% of the features. And those may be valuable features, but then you start thinking about, okay, you're using Office 365, but you're not actually using Teams yet. You actually haven't even set up a site yet for Teams in your organization. And so you have this digital transformation. You've signed your contract. You've added subscriptions of particular functionality. But what happens is, are the users actually using the subscriptions? Mm -hmm. And I'm not, again, talking about the simple one of, you know, we didn't roll it out and Bob and these individuals haven't used it. I'm talking about on paper, we're transforming because we see active use. But then when you actually look at the functionality being used, they're not using it. And then they still want an end result of more productive collaboration, whatever those things are, but they're not driving the feature use utilization. Right. And that's for various reasons. But that also is what's going on at the very granular level. Yeah. User adoptions, everything really, and 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 to to an extent, always has been. But certainly, in the cloud era, it's everything. You're not vendors aren't getting renewals without it, but you're also not having project success without it. So that's pretty key. Yeah, use use is use is the key, and I, I mean, I could go on. This could be its own <laughs> podcast, right? But like at the end of the day, these vendors, these cloud vendors, want you to subscribe. And yes, they like the revenue, obviously. And yes, there's downstream revenue and there's no ball to take home. You have to renew again, even if your community is only using 25% because you can't go away. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, um, use the meter running is what they want. It's why Judson at Microsoft has created an organization of free consulting services to make sure that organizations are using Azure, right? It's mm -hmm. the reason why Amy Hood at Microsoft gets up there at the tech conferences and talks about, uh, excuse me, the investor conferences, and she talks about it is the largest total available market. It's about the flywheel, right? It's about getting utilization and use. The problem is, that sounds great, but when going back to my initial point, what we're hearing is when it comes time to say, or I ask the question, well, what has Salesforce done? What has ServiceNow done? What has worked? What have they done to help you unlock all the features? Mm -hmm. The inevitable thing I have is, well, the sales rep is still trying to coordinate that meeting. But yet, two years have gone by and you're looking for an uplift on your renewal price and you haven't even gotten the use yet. Right. And and John, you wrote in, in a recent blog post, do you on um, this was the one on Revlon and CEOs and CFOs held accountable. You had a really nice breakdown of the of the most common failures for in in programs around transformational projects, and you included the everything from planning for adoption, validation of internal audit controls, which mm -hmm. I view is not coming up for air often right. enough. Uh, lack of adequate training uh, in process and business management in particular, which of course is a classic bugaboo. Failure to align business incentives with new ways of operating makes sense. Solution integrity, validation checks. But the one I really wanted to mention on your list was, because you just talked about obsessing over like a budget thing because you can measure it. You also said the lack of identification of and, ident and implementation of business process performance metrics. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you're not measuring the right things. Yeah. Um, the One of the things that we see um, quite often, and I'm going to try to make up a very simple example here, right? Um, let's think of a company that's putting in an ERP system, and every company has a, an accounts receivable function. And you would expect that accounts receivable function to be doing, let's pick a number, um, um, $100,000 a day on accounts receivable. Mm. If you don't plan when you're getting ready to do the implementation to be able to monitor the performance of that business process, 
and the system may be looking right, but your accounts receivable drops down to $50,000 a day and you don't know, nobody picks that up and understands that it's dropped down to $50,000 a day and you don't see that until the end of the month when you get ready to close your books. Now you've got this humongous problem that you didn't even know that you had, right? So one of the things we always talk about with our SIs and our clients is anytime that you're doing an implementation for the sake of operational continuity, you want to monitor the performance of that business process before and after you put in the system, not so much to make sure that it's improved, but to make sure that it's still running the way that you expected it to run as soon as you put that system in. Because right. most people look at the system and say, well, there's no errors. Well, mm. <laughs> And and is this the kind of topics that you get into when you're on? I know you travel to customers a lot. Is this the kind of stuff that they ask? Yeah, you most about? of the time when we go out there, well, they don't ask us about it, right? Mm. But it's the things that right. we bring up in order to be able to prevent them from having a problem. It's the kind of things that we bring up, and it's the kind of things that we challenge the systems integrators um, when we're helping them evaluate a proposal because. Mm. The systems integrators, by and large, know about all of this stuff. And I'm not going to fault the systems integrators here. They know about all of this stuff. But to the extent that the client doesn't understand it and the SIs are in competition with each other, right, they are strategically leaving things out of the process in order to be able to keep their bids relatively on par with each other. And what they'll end up doing then is leave these things out kind of de-risk or de-risking or oh, let's call it lowering the proposal. Client signs on. You know, then they might end up with a change order in the in the future to say, hey, we have to do these things or you end up with a delay. Most of the time you end up with a delay right near the end of the we go live where the business figures out, oh, we should have done all these things. Mm. And then they end up taking a three month delay and the SI ultimately benefits to, to, with that because the client chose to do the delay, not the SI. Adam, I wanted to talk to you about the cloud piece of this because um, I'm also an advocate in general for the value of so-called SaaS delivery. Um, I'm sold on it from a few different angles, including things like user experience, ease of updates, access to new functionality, the list goes on. Mm -hmm. But there's there's a couple of pretty big major buts that have emerged, I think, in this sort of new cloud world. One of which is that, first of all, integration problems haven't gone away. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about these digital transformation issues, you can't have you're basically recreating data silos in the cloud if you don't solve the integration issue. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. Second, lock-in hasn't really gone away. Uh, pricing models are not that different. They're subscription, so they're uh, what OPEX, not CAPEX, but but there, there's very little pay per consumption in, in the business software. I mean, we're starting to see it in infrastructure with serverless and stuff, but there's yep. still, like in my mind, that that's really unfinished. And, and in, in your work, I know that you get into this with your clients, but you have the same types of advisory issues around licensing and contracts. That business is still the same. Uh, I mean, 100%. And it's, it's really funny how this works. So I literally just got off a call coming into this and this exact topic with a CIO, um, it's $5 billion company local. Um, we were going, he was in the grant, he was in the weeds of what the final stages of negotiation and his exact question was, so let me understand this. This is a subscription, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, we used, we're used to on-premise. I buy the stuff. We have to maintain all that, right? pay for the software assurance. Obviously, you can tell probably I'm talking about Microsoft. But the point is, he said, I don't get it. I'm, I'm confused. I have to pay up front for a volume. They're telling me I need to add volume up front, which I told them I don't need. They're making me effectively buy air to lock in a price, which, by the way, when we benchmarked it, it wasn't even competitive. But the point is, I want full volume up front. I, want, I have to pay all of it up front. I then pay on my second year an annual lump sum. I then pay again in the third year. And then I don't own anything and I have to renew. And they're pushing back on me because I want some sort of assurance around what that pricing is going to look like when I have to renew. They're telling me something about maybe 15% cap. That doesn't sound right. This feels, and that was actually his word. He maybe has some explicitives around this, <laughs> exactly yeah. like what I'm used to. So I'm confused. Right. And I had to spend this whole time with him explaining him what they can and can't do. And there was definitely right. ways to make improvements. But that's fundamentally the issue. And I'm hearing it, whether it's Salesforce, again, it doesn't matter. The, the issue has become they are effectively getting away with it. And here's what I mean by that. 
If you think about what we talked about before, when we talk about digital transformation, these are not decisions being even made by the IT department. In a lot of instances, they're not. These are not decisions made, certainly not by procurement or anyone like that. These vendors that we're talking about, the major cloud vendors, they are selling to the CEO. They're selling the vision of the end state. The product is going to make your users, you're going to get updates, all these wonderful things. But let's not think about the licensing. Let's mm -hmm. not get into the contracting, right? Let's not get into that because why would we? You're a CEO. You're a board member. You're interested in the, the vision, right? And so what's happened is they've gotten such buy-in, vendor lock-in, right? Mm -hmm. They have that. And what's happened is there's no momentum to force the change, because ultimately who's gonna do it? And so what we typically do is we force change through knowing what they can and can't do. We put mm -hmm. that in front of them. We know what they're gonna say and counter it. So we go through that. But globally, the issue around cloud, and again, these are not just the major cloud vendors. It is very much the same. I commit to a volume. I commit to a type of product, whether it's the all-in bundle version or the lower thing. You keep it for the term of time. You pay annually in advance. The only real difference, though, is you don't own it, so there's no ball to take home, and you're beholden mm. to them because are you really going to switch? And one of the reasons they may not switch that you mentioned before, which is a great one, I just spent three years, using a typical subscription term, working through integrations, right. working through any necessary customizations, working through right. getting my users to actually use the functionality. And so all of a sudden, I'm going to walk away which again, feels very much like buying something, yeah. installing it, and living with it. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, it's good you guys are out there and, and firms like yourselves that, that, that can advise on that because to your point, the best way to get an edge right now is through superior negotiations around licensing and usage mm -hmm. and making the right decisions on which clouds to use. Yep. But having said that, I would just uh, say to vendors, like the transformation that you're pitching, you need to take it personally as well because – I, I think I think customers are looking for a different experience, right? When you talk about customer experience, they want a different experience around pricing and licensing as well as software delivery. Yeah. You know, yeah. On you know Adam's point, even if you're signing up with a systems integrator, and this sounds really bad because I'm going to sound like a lawyer and I'm not, but anytime that you get married to a, a an SI or a, um, a you know whether it be Google or not, you should always be planning for the breakup always be mm -hmm. thinking about what your exit strategy is mm -hmm. and exhibiting to that vendor that you're doing the things necessary to exit if you have to exit. That's mm -hmm. the way that you maintain leverage, right? Is you have to be down. You don't have to be saying, hey, I can leave you anytime. I can leave you anytime. But you have to be putting in place kind of, I'll say, all the documentation standards and all of the holding them up to their quality standards and all those things so that if you do have to leave, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the evidence we've seen is there's probably, even on renewals, there's probably 5 to 7% um, that you can get on reductions just because you are actually capable of leaving if you have to. Mm. And, and just real quick to, to jump in on that point, right? It's, it's really a lot of what's happening is it's also around who's actually delivering the message. So if we talk about everything we're talking about here, right? Big company has a transformation. They're going to put the word digital in front of it. They're going to get everyone excited, including their own shareholders. They're going to get the market excited because, wow, they care. And we're going to give the tools to our employee base and all that. They're going to play an Eminem song. A hundred percent. They're going to get everyone up. fired up and everyone's excited. <laughs> and that's wonderful. And the balloons come down and maybe they'll never pop, but eventually they will, right? Or deflate. And the point is when you enter these discussions, these negotiations, these renewal discussions, when you're having a CIO who's adamantly upset about why does this still feel like the world I'm used to? Why is the cloud still feel that way? The problem is, is that again, the message of change, right? Literally the message, the who says it, not what said is actually more important. And so I'll give you an example. We could literally put a deck, one slide, because it can't be more than one slide at a CEO level. We can get in front of them and say, hey, look, here's what your pricing is. Here's what they're charging you. Here's what the market bears. And I'm not talking your 10% out, 20% out. I'm talking your 35% out of market. You have no renewal protections. You have no swap rights. And I don't want to go too tactical here, but you summarize that for them. Mm. 
And then they say, well, they are still a very strategic vendor. I'm going to be at Dreamforce. They've invited me to be part of the keynote speak. Benioff is going to be with me. I have a great And that's great. So now mm. think about this. The CIO gets in the room and complains and procurement maybe is part of that discussion as well, which we work with procurement. But here's the thing. If it's not a unified message, if the individual who's part of the vision, this, whether it's the CEO, the head of HR, the head of sales is not part of it, by the way, with truth, it's going to be difficult. So it's that whole thing about the story ultimately is going to matter most, not right. the I want something different. It's the story. The problem is, is that getting them to deliver the story is difficult because at the end of the day, to their KPIs, they have transformed or to their KPIs, they have been successful mm. and they don't get into the weeds because the business case has already been built. We're paying X, revenue went up, whatever it is. Right. So why does the vendor need to change? Yeah. All right. Well, we need to wrap soon, but I want to go through just a few quick hits on, it's been a busy news uh week or two in the in the cloud area that you're analyzing was so uh, keep keep you busy on your weekly uh, head in the clouds update there uh, most recently the the massive tableau acquisition and a quick comment on that uh yep quick comment um exactly aligned with what S salesforce is trying to do it is tied to the fact that at the end of the day they figured out and by the way this was probably back about three years ago. In fact, we know it was three years ago because if you remember right when Colin Powell's email got hacked and it was released, he was a board member at Salesforce and Tuscany was on the list and Tuscany was Tableau. And so the point is they've been thinking about this for over three years and this is what it, they were thinking about. We are going to pitch customer 360, right? So you could be at Dreamforce or anywhere as you're going to see the circle, you're going to see customer 360. Okay, so how do we get the customers, ours, I'm being Salesforce, how do they get them a view of their customers to be successful, to be tr digital transformation success? Well, we need to get functionality, capability to tether this all together tied to data, mm. right? Getting data accessible, visual, and then valuable. They need to do that to close the loop on customer 360. They did it originally, or not originally, the first step was MuleSoft. Huge purchase. They're already getting significant value out of that. They're pushing that hard. And then they came in and said, we need to do more around data. And so Tableau was sitting there. And that's the reason they put $15.7 billion to acquire the stock of that company, because they understand without it, they're not going to be able to do the full customer 360. The real interesting thing about this is that what customers really need to start thinking about is that, yes, what is Salesforce going to do with the solution and how that's going to work? But more importantly, if you're a Tableau customer, and even if you're already a Salesforce customer, but if you're not, here's what, and by the way, the CEO of Tableau literally came out and said, the thing he's most excited about, he's most excited about because Salesforce has a really good sales organization that has really good relationships where they can sell more of Tableau. Mm -hmm. And so there's two ways to look at that. There's the value, the reason why, but now if you're sitting back, you need to really start thinking about your portfolio because it's changing quickly. Even even though Tableau is primarily on-premise in terms of its customer base, that didn't raise your eyebrows at all? And so here's the part about that. I believe that what Salesforce has figured out is that and this actually goes exactly to what we were just talking about. They're a cloud company, right? But they're going to be able to acquire portions of functionality that doesn't fit that because what they've actually transformed themselves into is a customer 360 platform company, which allows them to get away with their segments of the 360 that mm. aren't purebred cloud. And the more they start slicing that in and tying it to the vision to the CEO of the pieces collecting to a whole, mm -hmm. they're going to get away with it. And I'm not saying get away like it's a bad or good thing. Sure. That's just part that of it. model's going to work for them. In, in fact, yeah. Benioff just literally said this on the earnings call. He said, we are a customer 360 platform company. He's starting to set the message. Now, again, he's co-CEO, blocks in there obviously as well. But the point is, it's shaping. And I know these are words, but that matters, again, when you start thinking about their words that are being intendedly said to resonate to what they want to do, which is sell to not IT, distinction between on-premise and cloud, but to the person 
individual at the top who may not be as interested or concerned about that if it still links to the vision. Right. Okay. One more news thing. I would argue that the most interesting company you're covering and writing about is Google. And this whole theme of is Google enterprise ready is quite fascinating, obviously setting the stage with the hiring of Thomas Curry and the subsequent hiring of Rob Enslin, mm -hmm. uh, both of whom have a lot of cloud experience, but also enterprise chops. Then you have uh, more recent developments, including the acquisition of Looker, which I th happen to think is a pretty excellent product. And then also uh, the Google Cloud outages. Uh, which raises another angle on this whole thing. So, so, so it, it, it's been a few months since you wrote your piece on is Google Enterprise ready. So, how do you sort of incorporate the new stuff into that view? So, it is <laughs> Google Cloud uh, Enterprise ready is in, uh, proverbially the thing, and here's what I mean by that: every large enterprise customer that we've worked with over the years is a Microsoft customer. Okay, and so what happens is, and I'm talking productivity, obviously platform AWS is obviously the market leader. But what's happened is, is that they've been getting away with certain things because they are the proverbial, if you don't like it, go to the other Microsoft. Google's figured this out because I have a lot of money, a lot of cash to build out my enterprise business. And it's ripe, it's ripe now because two main reasons. One, if you think about the competition, you think about AWS, there's an entire market out there that isn't going to give business to AWS, i.e. retail. The second part to it is Microsoft customers are not happy with Microsoft. So Google's sitting here thinking, how do we figure out how to unlock this and get market share? So the way we're going to do it is we're going to bring in executives who absolutely know the enterprise space. They went to a Google exec and went to an SAP exec. That's important, very important. But here's what's happening. 18 months ago, we started working with organizations that said, hey, you know what? I'm not comfortable saying I'm going to evaluate Google, whether it was platform or on the productivity suite. I'm not comfortable doing it because they're not ready. 18 months ago. 12 months ago, I'm starting to feel like, you know, I'm going to let them in. Let's talk about it. Now, there's data center issues. Are they fully, truly valuable? Are they actually focused on enterprise customers? Because I'm hearing a lot about, not a lot about them. I hear a lot about Whammo and other things. How focused are they? Now let's go six months ago. Now these same companies, same size, large $50 billion companies that we work with are saying, hey, Adam, um, they are coming in. We are going to evaluate them. And we're not only just evaluating them because you know we're curious about what's going to be like in 18 months. We're going to evaluate them because I'm actually thinking about in the next six to nine months, we're going to start using them. And so I asked the question, what, what do you, in what capacity? The first one is I'm, I'm thinking platform, right? AWS, they're great, but I'm thinking on the Google Cloud platform side, we're already in that path. Architectures are already working in it, okay? In engineering, they're already evaluating it. But I'm now thinking about on the G Suite side because I have a whole community of people who I have nothing for. So why would I just give Microsoft more business? This F1 SKU, okay, great, but do they need it? These employees that are coming up, deskless, first-line workers, they, most of them, through my research and what HR is telling me, going back to that point, they actually use Google already. And so if my goal is to make them productive, then why wouldn't I give them the functionality that they're already used to under the blanket of where your corporation that you work for, we're giving you the tools you know. And so now what's happening is now, right, today's point in time, we're in scenarios where these same companies are now actually negotiating going to them. But here's what happened. You mentioned the outage. The problem is, is like with all things, then the reality of the situation starts to set in. Everything's looking great. We're moving forward. And then alert, alert, there's an outage. <laughs> if you're now the person who's responsible for- Which Google uh, describes as a slowdown, by the way. 100%. I love that. <laughs> right. The, sl the slowdown, right? So which I, which I wrote is actually worse than an outage because the slowdown, you're attempting to do crap and then you don't get anything done and you're like, what the hell? 100%. Yeah. The worst thing about it, like exactly. Slowdown's great. When's it going to not be slow? And then the other part to it is slow or stop in my world, enterprise- Slow is stop. Right. Yeah. Like, okay, my users, it's accessible kind of. Like, right. what does that even mean? So anyhow, you have this 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 in, this new issue. Right. And so the issue is yeah. there. And now there's a pause because there's all this momentum. 
And by the way, I'm saying pause and brief. I know this will be figured out and I know that they'll continue to move down this path. But what I'll tell you is right now, that momentum, these big companies that we're working with, it's still um, an elevated level of interest and viability. Right. But there's a pause because it goes back to everything we've been talking about here. Sure. The person who wants to make that change has to now get in front of whoever right. it may be to build the business case to get the approvals. And they're going to go, um, are you going to get assurances that I'm not going to live in that? Mm. And then what are they going to say? And right now, this is a one-time thing. We've corrected it. We've root cause analysis. And that's all well and good. But that slows down the momentum. Now, the acquisition, Looker, um, I believe that you know we've already started seeing, obviously, ramped up acquisitions in this space. That's similar tableau, right? It's right. all data. You know, this is all going to happen. The thing that Google has, and I tell this to the guys around here and gals, the thing that Google has is they have a, a Death Star. They can point cash at anything that they want that to the magnitude that they can. There's only a few other companies that can. They happen to be the two that they're Microsoft and Amazon, but the point is they have the money. Right. And so if you are, you know, one of these companies, and by the way, service now, you need to be thinking about if you're one of their customers, how quickly or when are you going to become a Google customer? Now I'm just putting that out there, but the point is a value cap of 20 billion is nothing right. to them. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm not suggesting that an enterprise should be excited about acquisition coming to right. choose them as an enterprise partner. But what I'm telling you is I am excited about a company if I'm an enterprise that has the money to correct, build, or acquire stuff that I need. All right. Well, we'll look forward to your weekly updates yes. on that in Head in the Clouds. Uh, John, I know you have to head out in just a sec, John, but just one more thing for you, and we'll wrap this podcast uh, I want to get back to this notion of the role of independence because that's mm -hmm. what got me down here on this crappy, rainy Boston day uh, is to talk to you guys about this. And um, it's something I've been advocating for years. When you look at project failures in our industry, yeah. there's almost always an over-dependence on the prime vendor as one of the key yeah. ingredients. And I rarely do I see in a description of a massive project failure – they were talking closely with a number of, of qualified independent advisors the whole time who were giving them rapid gut checks on the problems, but they failed anyway. I never see that. Mm -hmm. But but I but I see dependence on the prime, dependence on the prime, dependence mm -hmm. on the prime. However, there is a little bit of a counterpoint, and, and it comes from uh, a reader of mine, Bill Wood, who's a, a longtime independent consultant. And and to be clear, there's a variety of types of independence on, sure. on products. We can't go into all that right now. But the point being, like that, the counterpoint that I think is somewhat valid, which he brings up, is that that independent has to really be good. And sometimes it can be problematic to manage another voice at the table, sure. um, politically speaking. And he he goes on a long example, but I just wanted to to read part of it. Uh, around independence. He says, when pressed for how they could contribute to a true teamwork approach, the third party leader of the independent grew visibly upset. I could go on, but you get the picture. This is someone who's providing product oversight. He says, it, it's easy to sit on a grassy knoll taking sniper shots to attack a project. Sorry for the violent analogy, but that's what he wrote. And potentially undermine it with petty things when there's no accountability for the third party. And he goes on. So I think he raises an important point. So how do you kind of reconcile the need for independence, but but also the challenges for the customer and the accountability of, 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 of managing all that. Yeah. Well, first of all, I would say um, I, I understand what his point is, mm -hmm. right? Clearly, because, because an independent, an independent advisor or somebody being a part of the project, oftentimes an order bill for them to feel valuable, they have to bring up points, right? That's got, that's part of the job sure. to, to, to bring to up bring, nits. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. To, to bring up, to bring up those yeah. points. Right. Um, but from my perspective, it's always, <laughs> I want to say this, you oftentimes get the best advice from the people that are, have the least at stake. So yeah. from the standpoint of being able to look at a project holistically, right. And say, provide you a view from the balcony, um, of what we think the risks are. I would always advocate, you know, not treating that independent advisor as, Oh, by the way, here are all the problems. How are you going to fix the problems that I identified? Right. I would always say, let the independent advisor identify what they perceive to be the risks are for the project or the issues are of the project and treat mm. that advice in the context of the risk management log that the project is actually 
executing to, right? Bring in those risks, incorporate them into the risk management process. Don't treat them any differently than any other risks that the project has, but take their advice as being, these are things that I've identified, prioritize them in the list of everything else for the project and see where it comes out. I I would tell you this, one of our tests is to always go out and look at the risk log of the project itself. And I can inevitably tell you three things about that risk log. One, it's probably not going to have any risks in there associated with operational continuity. Mm -hmm. Two, it's not going to have any risks in there associated with benefit capture. And three, most of the risks that are included within that risk log are directly related to the systems integrator being successful on their contract, not the client being successful on their part of the contract. And I would tell any client, go pull your risk log out, take a look at it, and tell me if it doesn't meet those three criteria that I said. Good enough. We're going to have to leave it there. I know you got to catch a plane. Thanks, guys, for the excellent talk. Till the next time. Thanks. Thank you.